Hello everyone. In this presentation, we shall take a look at cervical smears, which are categorized as negative for intraepithelial lesions or malignancies, or so-called NIL, under the Bethesda system. This is part one of two presentations, which cover normal cell elements and changes that are unrelated to organisms. In part two of the lecture, which is going to come up later on, I shall discuss the changes associated with specific organisms. So, when we say negative for intraepithelial lesions or malignancies, we use this as a phrase during reporting under general categorization and or the section called interpretation slash results of the report in smears which show no evidence of neoplasia. The reporting of additional findings like organisms or other non-neoplastic findings is optional according to Bethesda. However, it is a common practice in most centers to report these findings. The reasons being that the reporting of organisms may help the clinician to decide upon specific therapy and also and rather more importantly, many of the morphological changes associated with certain predisposing conditions, which you are going to see during the course of this presentation, closely resemble epithelial abnormalities and being aware of them should help in avoiding some pretty serious diagnostic pitfalls. So this is a view of the Bethesda system cervical cytopathology and this is one of the slides which I have copied from the previous talk on this particular series on cervical cytopathology and today we are going to talk about negative for intraepithelial lesions or malignancies which can be used as a general categorizations or it can also be used under interpretation and results with the reporting of the other changes which could be associated with it or could be leading to some of the changes that we see under this category. So, the reporting of NELM should always be reported as the primary interpretation. This is followed by a mention of additional findings. For example, if you come across a smear where you just see normal elements without any intraepithelial lesion or malignancy, you can just keep it as nil. Or, for example, you can report something as LILM with reactive changes associated with inflammation, if you see those changes. Or, for example, NILM and say fungal organisms morphologically consistent with candida species are present. So, these are the different ways by which we can report NILM depending upon what we see in the slide. So, in this particular talk, I shall be covering the normal cellular elements and certain non-neoplastic cell variations, changes which are related to reactive and reparative cellular alterations associated with inflammation, lymphocytic cervicitis, radiation or the use of intrauterine contraceptive devices and also another particular entity that is the presence of glandular cells post hysterectomy. So let's first look at the normal cell elements. This could be absolutely basic but still it is extremely important that we have a clear understanding of the normal cell elements. Now, before we go into the cytology of the normal cell elements, it might be a good idea to remind ourselves of the normal histology of the uterine cervix. So, this is the area of the stratified squamous epithelium of the ectocervix with the superficial cells on top, followed by the intermediate cells under them, the parabasal cells, and right below are the basal cells. Now, we usually do not see basal cells on cervical smear unless and until we are dealing with extremely atrophic smears. This is the coamo-columnar junction with the stratified squamous epithelium 
towards this side and the endocervical glandular epithelium or columnar epithelium below over here. Now, the two major types of squamous cells which you see on cervi most cervical smears are the superficial squamous cells and the intermediate squamous cells. The superficial squamous cells are usually eosinophilic. The intermediate squamous cells can be amphophilic or cyanophilic. They are distinguished from each other by mainly by the appearance of the nuclei. The superficial squamous cells have a small dark pycnotic nuclei. They are essentially dead cells. Whereas the intermediate squamous cells have larger nuclei around 50 micrometers and they have opened up chromatin and may show prominence of nucleoli. These cells are also called ruler cells. The reasons being that by comparing the size of the nuclei with the size of the other cells which could be abnormal cells we can say that by how much the other cells are enlarged. Right? The other reasons why they are called ruler cells is because it also gives you an idea about chromasia. So this is roughly the normal chromasia that you expect in benign cell elements. And so by comparing and by with this chromatin pattern or this degree of this chromasia, you can say that whether an abnormal cell which you think is an abnormal cell is hyperchromatic or not. And that is why it is very important to have a clear idea of what the size and the chromasia of intermediate squamous cells look like. This cell over here is a parabasal cell which is a much smaller cell than say a superficial squamous cell which is over here. It has got a kind of an ellipsoid oval kind of a shape and it has got a nucleus which is centrally placed. The nuclear size is uh, roughly the size of an intermediate squamous uh, of a nuclear of an intermediate squamous cell or slightly larger so this cell is a parabasal cell it is usually not found in most of the smears but in certain situations like in case of atrophy these cells become the predominant cell component as you are going to see in subsequent part of the lecture now there are certain changes that can affect the squamous cells this for example is a situation when the cells are distended with glycogen and again there are certain conditions when the cells show a lot of glycogen. I shall be talking about that a little bit later on. And there are other variations. For example, there could be little dot-like structures. These are keratohyaline granules, which is actually a marker of keratosis. Again, something which will be discussed later on. Here you have got squamous cells that can take an absolutely spindle shape these are benign squamous cells. Spindle cells doesn't necessarily mean that we are dealing with malignancies, right? Like the so-called tadpole cells, which you see in squamous cell carcinomas. Yes, that can happen. But sometimes the benign squamous cells can look spindly. And sometimes you can have these kind of rafts of cells. Once again, could be a marker of keratosis, where you have got this nuclei, which have a kind of a spindly appearance and they create this so-called raft-like morphology. Again, it can happen without any abnormality of the squamous epithelium. So these are some changes which you can see and you can still categorize them as nil. And unless and until we see specific changes in the nuclei which make us move into the realms of epithelial abnormalities. Now, these are the next main group of cells, the endocervical cells and uh, their appearance depends upon how they are present on the slide. So if you see a kind of an end-on appearance, this has got the so-called honeycomb pattern, a fairly monotonous population of cells, monolayered, little bit of overlap is fine. We shall be talking about this in great details when we go to the lecture on glandular abnormalities. These cells could be markedly distended with mucin. The amount of mucin can be variable. Again, these are another group of endocervical cells where the amount of mucin is not too high. 
and here endocervical cells are present in a way so that you are looking at them side on which gives you the so-called picket, fin picket fence appearance and because of the smearing we may find a little bit of so-called pseudo stratification but that doesn't necessarily mean that we are dealing with a glandular abnormality we have to look into a lot of other features together to call it a glandular abnormality here i have shown this to show you that a little bit of pseudo stratification is pretty okay we don't call them as a glandular abnormality again something which we shall discuss in detail in that particular lecture on glandular abnormalities now the next group of cells are the squamous metaplastic cells these cells have got this angulated ends and they are present in the form of these aggregates sometimes they can be present singularly they can the aggregates can be of various sizes as you can see over here this group of aggregate of just four cells a little bit more right and the nucleocytoplasmic ratio as a kind of a marker is supposed to be like less than 50 percent once it goes beyond 50 percent then we start thinking in terms of squamous intraepithelial lesions and going to the realms of atypical squamous cells high grade cannot be excluded and other changes which again we shall be discussing in detail in the lectures which are dedicated to squamous abnormalities sometimes and this is a picture which i have picked up from the bethesda web atlas the metaplastic cells can show this spider like processes which is absolutely fine see a little bit of hyperchromasia but uh, and a little bit of irregularity over here but then uh, that could be pretty much okay and sometimes the picture you know can be a little bit different based on the you know the, the color and other settings so this picture is just to show you that you can have uh, these kind of spidery processes in metaplastic squamous cells the next group of cells we are going to talk about are the endometrial cells and they can be pretty common if the smear is taken during the initial period of the menstrual cycle within six or seven days of the last menstrual period and uh, you have these ball-like clusters of cells okay, which have a very high nucleocytoplasmic ratio they are hyperchromatic but in uh, the thin prep uh, and uh, so-called liquid-based cytology preparations, thin prep or uh, uh, sheopath, uh, with very good fixation, the chromatin can look a bit opened up and so that sometimes even the nucleoli may be vaguely visible. In certain situations, you have this kind of uh, area with so-called very hypertight clusters. The center of the cluster the, or the aggregation is extremely tight is a very tight aggregate of cells and as you go towards the periphery it is loose so if you are not aware of this we may start thinking in terms of some kind of an architectural abnormality and feel that we are possibly dealing with an atypical glandular cell or atypical endometrial cell in general or, uh, in, or in, uh, and but this is not the case so these are normal exfoliated endometrial cells right sometimes endocervical cells can look like endometrial cells when they are very tightly clustered like over here but then if you look at the one of the edges you can still see the very clearly visible columnar shape and the cytoplasm is right over here nuclei are towards the base so if you look at this part you should be able to easily identify them as endocervical cells in atrophic smears, the amount of cytoplasm in the endocervical cells can reduce significantly, thereby making these endocervical cells very closely resemble endometrial cells. But then again, if you look at this group and if you uh, believe that this is all from the same group of cells, if you just move towards this side, you can start seeing the cytoplasm and this will help you identify these as endocervical rather than endometrial cells so it is very important to remember that sometimes the endocervical cells especially in atrophic smears and we shall take a look at that a little bit later again can look like endometrial cells so 
The next entity that I'm going to deal with is the entity that is endometrial cells, which are directly brushed from the lower uterine skin. The previous ones were endometrial cells, which have been normally exfoliated, but these are directly brushed endometrial cells from the lower uterine segment. Now, there are certain situations when your chances of getting these directly brushed endometrial cells rather than the normally exfoliated endometrial cells which you saw in the previous smears go up. And what are these predisposing conditions? Most of them are related to procedures. So if certain procedures have been carried out on the patient, like where there has been a conization or a loop electrosurgical excision or a process called trachelectomy, where uh, an endocervix sparing operation done in case of a patient who has got a stratified squamous, um, uh, which, uh, who has got a squamous cell carcinoma, sorry about that. So uh, under these circumstances, the length of the endocervix is shortened. And when somebody is taking a cervical smear, it is a very good chance that you might be sampling cells from the lower uterine segment. Under these circumstances, uh, these cells can come on the cervical smear. So on the clinical request form, it is extremely important to look for these uh, uh, mention of these particular procedures which have been carried on. And even if it has not been carried on out and if it has not been sent on the clinical request form, uh, if you are uh, forewarned about these uh, cellular elements. If you are aware of them, you can always call up the clinician and find out that if such a procedure has been carried out because some of these, as you will see in the subsequent slides, can look like glandular abnormalities. The other situation, even if such a procedure has not been carried out, is that if uh, a very vigorous use of endocervical brush or broom has been done, then there could be direct endometrial sampling from the lower uterine segment. So what do these cells look like? This is another picture from the Bethesda Web Atlas. So what you see over here are these cells, which are pretty tightly clustered. Okay, so these are the glandular cells, which are attached to some kind of stromal elements. And there is a kind of a feathering towards the edges and you could even find a trace of a blood vessel running through it, right? So if you are not aware of this, you might end up calling this as a glandular abnormality, like an atypical glandular cells, or even start thinking of glandular neoplasia. But if you know, and if you are aware of these morphological features, then you will not make this mistake. So you are aware of the fact that these cells are cells which are lower uterine segment, which has been directly brushed. The other picture over here is sometimes you can have the entire endometrial gland come out, like these organoid tube-like structures. The cells over here are arranged in the form of a palisade, right? So one might, if you, one is not aware of this morphological change, one might be tempted to call this as a glandular abnormality. Uh, which of course it is not, and these are, these are just uh, uh, directly brushed endometrial cells from the lower uterine segment. And when you go to the higher bar, look how closely it looks like a glandular abnormality. And I can assure you that I shall bring these slides back uh, as during discussing the differential diagnosis in the lecture on glandular lesions. But you can see over here this palisading appearance of the palisading of nuclei over here and then they're extremely closely packed nuclei but if you look very closely you are going to find that the nuclei are rather uniform and in areas where they are less closely packed there seems to be a kind of a, a monolayered pattern to it so uh, please remember these changes which can occur as a result of direct lash brushing of endometrial cells from the lower uterine segment uh, this is another change which you might see sometimes the spindle shaped stromal cells can come out uh, from the lower uterine segment and uh, this is one of the cha uh, changes which may be seen under these conditions. Right.
The next group of lesions that we are going to talk about are keratotic cellular changes. So we must remember that the squamous epithelium of the cervix is normally non-keratinizing. Now either as a response to HPV or as a protective reactive phenomena to injury, the squamous epithelium of the cervix may resemble that of the epidermis, that means it is going to show keratosis. So there are various phrases that have been used, many of them there is not too much of a consensus about the use of this phase. Phrases, the pathologist doesn't say that you have to report them, right? You may or may not include it, these changes in your report. But one group of changes are called hyperkeratosis, which are either represented by presence of anucleate squamous cells on cervical smear or by the presence of keratohyaline granules. The other group of lesions are called parakeratosis, where you have got changes like uh, squamous pearls and squamous pearls, or cells which normally should not show keratinization, like, for example, a parabasal or a metaplastic cell which show keratin. The other thing which is included under this group of changes called keratotic cellular changes are dyskeratosis. So what is dyskeratosis? Dyskeratosis is something, for example, a parakeratosis, but the nuclear, the nuclei of these cells are abnormal enough to categorize them as an squamous epithelial abnormality. Changes associated with dyskeratosis will be discussed in the lecture which is dedicated to squamous intraepithelial lesions. So in the next few slides, I shall be showing you some pictures related to hyperkeratosis and parakeratosis. So hyperkeratosis, one of the features of hyperkeratosis or one of the situations where you can, we can say that there is hyperkeratosis is the presence of anucleated squams and in the place where there is supposed to be a nuclei, there is an empty space like a ghost of a nuclei. So this is one of the changes which could be attributed to hyperkeratosis, anucleated squamous cells. But at the same time, one should not forget that there is a pitfall. If you just have anucleated squamous cells, you should look at the rest of the smear very carefully because sometimes Invasive squamous cell carcinomas, which of course is going to have other changes, may show a large number of enucleated squamous cells. The other change associated with hyperkeratosis, which you have already seen before, the presence of this keratohyaline granules in an otherwise intermediate or superficial squamous cells. I have even sometimes seen them in parabasal cells. So what is parakeratosis? So here is a group of cells which you can call possibly parabasal or metaplastic. And one of these cells, so this is what the normal cytoplasmic appearance of these cells should be like. They're opaque and um, uh, that is what an, an amphophilic or cyanophilic. But then one of these cells show the presence of keratin, an abnormal keratinization, but the nucleus is okay. The nuclear changes do not deserve the designation of a squamous intraepithelial lesion. So in this case, we call it parakeratosis. If, however, the nuclear changes would have been enough to call them abnormal, then we would use the phrase or the, the, the term dyskeratosis. This is another change which is designated as parakeratosis, the presence of the squamous cell in a kind of a whirl or a squamous pearl. So this is another of the changes which is called parakeratosis. The next group of changes is something which is called tubal metaplasia. It is not that infrequent that you are going to come across cells which are endocervical cells. You can easily appreciate the columnar shape, the basally located the, the, the nuclei, right? And then what you find is 
In fact, here, in fact, the new player is not located towards the base. But however, what you can see very clearly over here is the presence of cilia. So this can be called as ciliated endocervical cells or it can also be called as evidence of tubal metaplasia. So you may be able to see them. Now here the nuclear features are pretty good. You are not going to think in terms of a glandular um, abnormality. However, the important thing to remember about tubal metaplasia is that tubal metaplasia in cells with tubal metaplasia, there can be a significant amount of nuclear enlargement, hyperchromasia, and nuclear overlapping, as a result of which they have a very close resemblance to a glandular, a glandular abnormality, like what we would otherwise designate as atypical glandular cells or AGC. However, when you look at the edge you are going to find the cilia over here, which tells you that this is tubal metaplasia. So it is extremely important to identify the cilia and thus designate it as just a tubal metaplasia with some degree of, possibly some degree of ATP as a kind of a descriptive term, but this is not an atypical glandular cell. So this is one of the pitfall of atypical glandular cell is a tubal metaplasia. So whenever you find cells like this, please look at the edges to see if there is cilia or not. Next, changes associated with atrophy as a result of very low amount of estrogen, which is the main hormone responsible for the maturation of the squamous cell in the way you saw the first slide which I showed you the histology of the ectocervix. So during menopause and certain other conditions when the amount of estrogen is low it can lead to a number of changes which is associated with atrophy. So one of the things which you see are these kind of very tight clusters of cells which are tight clusters of, of atrophic uh, basal or atrophic so-called metaplastic cells and they can actually show a significant amount of overlap, which I have seen. So overlap does not, in these circumstances, in severe atrophy, doesn't necessarily mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that we are dealing with something like a high-grade cell or some other kind of squamous abnormality or even a glandular abnormality. So in severely atrophic smears, when you have these very large, tight uh, aggregates of cells, almost looks like, uh, like, a, like a tissue fragment almost, there is a lot of overlap, it is perfectly okay to call it a NILM and it is just consistent with atrophic changes, right? Atrophy can have different kinds of appearances. Most of the time in atrophy, you find a mixture of cells. You are going to find these very tight clusters of cells of parabasal metaplastic cells but many of the time the parabasal cells in most of the situations in a very clean background otherwise are going to be singly scattered like this. You see that the superficial squamous cells are almost non-existent. That's because there is not enough of estrogen to mature the squamous epithelium right up to its fullest extent. So this is one of the uh, pictures that you may see with atrophy. So the first one and this is the second one. Right. This is another picture, like once again, with a large number of parabasal cells, some metaplastic cells of various sizes, otherwise a clean background. However, certain, in certain circumstances, you are going to find parabasal cells, but you are going to find a lot of intermediate squamous cells. Right? So there is some amount of estrogen, not enough to bring it over to the level of superficial squamous cells, but you can have an atrophic smear, but the predominant cells are intermediate squamous cells that you have over here. There appears to be a little bit of nuclear enlargement, but that is okay. With this amount of nuclear enlargement in an atrophic smear, say a menopausal woman or a perimenopausal human, you shouldn't call this as something like an ascus, right? So it, it may look like ascus, but it is not ascus. Again, we are going to discuss this in detail on the lecture of squamous intraepithelial lesions. Now, 
This is another thing which can happen in menopause, post-menopause, late menopause, and that is changes which are called atrophic vaginitis, in which you have a lot of degenerative changes. You see the population of parabasal cells, but there is a lot of degenerative cells. There are a lot of cytoplasmic debris, some amount of nuclear debris, some amount of inflammatory cells, right? You can see a lot of debris over here. And in this situation, once again, there is a good chance that you are going to come across a large number of parakeratotic cells. Doesn't really mean anything. You're still dealing with a lesion, with a smear, which you are going to call negative for intraepithelial lesion or malignancy. Then you put a slash and you say the features of or with features of atrophic vaginitis. That's it. Now, atrophic smears, you have to raise your threshold of calling something as a squamous intraepithelial lesion because as a result of atrophy, as a result of drying or other changes, you can see some degree of nuclear engagement, little bit of hyperchromasia, little bit of irregularity. Uh, although, yes, you can find the presence of squamous intraepithelial lesion in a background of atrophy. What I'm trying to say over here that you should raise your threshold of calling something a squamous intraepithelial lesion when you find atrophic changes. As you can see over here, there is a degree, quite a significant amount of nuclear debris uh, and cellular debris in general. So these are some of the changes which can happen in atrophic smear. In an atrophic smear, even the endocervical cells, and I made a mention of this a little while ago, can show a reduction in the amount of cytoplasm. Their nuclei can start getting a little bit hyperchromatic. Okay, so they're like atrophic endocervical cells. And sometimes they can even look like uh, endometrial cells. Now these are hyperchromatic crowded clusters, severely atrophic parabasal cells with a lot of overlap. And I say overlap can be found. It doesn't necessarily mean that we are dealing with something sinister or something generally like a squamous intraepithelial lesion. This is perfectly okay for an atrophic smear without the presence of any squamous intraepithelial lesion. Now, we will move on into the next group of lesion and these are changes which are related to pregnancy, during pregnancy, during postpartum period and also seen in patients who may not be pregnant but who are on certain hormonal therapy like progesterone. So what you'll find in pregnancy related changes, you see a lot of intermediate cells and some parabasal cells and these cells may show a little bit of nuclear enlargement. You know? There could be some amount of nuclear enlargement once again because of a relative lowering in the level of it because the amount of estrogen is not really that high to help maturation to occur right and uh, the other thing that we see are cells with these clear spaces with a little bit of a yellow tinge which we know is due to accumulation of glycogen some of these cells have a boat like shape as a result of which these are called navicular cells right and even the endocervical cells over here can show a little bit of hyperchromasia, a little bit of changes related to lack of estrogen i think there is some work that is done that how the lack of estrogen also affects the morphology of the endocervical cells. So these are pregnancy related changes which show the presence of glycogen accumulation. Very very sharp border but this is not a colocyte and one of the things which helps you identify that is the fact that you have this kind of this yellow tinge which is indicative of glycogen and uh, it doesn't have the very sharp kind of a cookie cutter edge which is associated with colocyte most of the time so uh, sometimes they can look very they might closely resemble colocytes yes they can but then you know that this is uh, related to pregnancy postpartum period so one second your threshold of calling side colocyte should go high. Not that you cannot find a colocyte 
in a postpartum spin you can but it is just a matter of balancing our threshold of what you call a colocide and what you, and you should be aware of these changes okay this is something which is extremely interesting which i picked up from the handle of linda johnston on twitter and i was very lucky to come across this picture this is an areas stellar reaction right and if you do not know that the patient is pregnant okay or in the postpartum period all right sometimes it can persist uh you definitely call this as a glandular abnormality you might even go on and call this as some kind of a a, a, a glandular neoplasia right like an endometrial carcinoma why not however if you are aware of the patient's status as being pregnant or in the postpartum period you should immediately remember that this is what area stellar reaction can look like so it really looks extremely sinister looks pretty uh, scary if i can say but as you can see the cells are present in this kind of ball like clusters nuclear enlargement uh, pretty abnormal uh, quite abnormal chromatin but these vacuoles are also present inside the cell so this would call for a diagnosis of a glandular uh, abnormality a glandular neoplasia unless not until this patient you know if this patient is not pregnant right uh, and look at this one this really looks a very ugly cell but this is all benign okay this is area stellar reaction uh, one of the big pitfalls in cervical cytology uh, fortunately it is uh, extremely rare but it can come in once in a while and if you are not aware of this you are going to end up making a mistake so if you see a cell like this in a young woman these and he, uh, he call the clinician find out that how how is she I mean, is she pregnant is it postpartum sometimes the clinicians might forget to mention it in the cervicals on your request form so there you are it looks absolutely scary but there is but this is a benign this, this is negative for intraepithelial lesion or malignancy now sometimes you can find residual cells right uh, they look like squamous cells right and uh, they can show some degree of nuclear enlargement and you may end up calling it as a low grade cell or ascus etc but this is what residual cells can look like uh, this is another picture from the Bethesda web atlas very rarely you can come across a cell like this a large cell with numerous nuclei this is a syncytiotrophoblast but something which is far more scary I, I couldn't pick up anything from our record so I uh, was able to get this from the web but from an article way back 1996 by Michael et al published in Diagnostic Cytopathology these are uh, cytotrophoblasts now if a cytotrophoblast appears as a single cell like this you see over here this looks like a high grade cell right very high NC ratio extremely hyperchromatic right look at this over here this may resemble something like a uh, a reparative group of repair features of repair in a metaplastic squamous cell but again extremely hyperchromatic nuclei and what what are these vacuoles doing and sometimes they may be present as very tight clusters um, and uh, you know just ring up warning bells but these are cytotrophoblastic cells occurring as single cells it may be present as a wall tight clusters they once again extremely rare but we should be aware of it we should be aware of these conditions and whenever you are looking at a cervical smear in a lady pregnancy postpartum period or postpartum period you have to be very very careful of not over calling stuff you should tell yourself that i'm going to see stuff i'm going to see cells which are going to push me towards the diagnosis of a glandular abnormality or a squamous abnormality so i have to be very careful once you have told yourself that the chances of making a mistake goes down significantly next reactive cellular changes associated with inflammation including typical repair now many of under many circumstances you may have inflammation and you'll also have some organisms say for example trichomonas but sometimes you are not going to find any organisms these are just reactive changes associated with inflammation and sometimes show cells with features of uh, repair 
okay so the one which is included under this is typical repair so what are the changes associated with inflammation now in this particular slide i'm going to show you two changes one of them is the fact that there is a degree of squamous baculation there are some bacilli we are going to talk about it some other time that's not uh, constant we just ignore the the organisms for the time being but to just to show you that there are these vacuolations which can occur in squamous cells. Now these vacuolations have a very uh, ill-defined kind of an edge uh, and does not, they do not have the typical sharp edges of a coelocyte. So these are not coelocytes now. If you look at the nuclei of these cells, the cell there is a significant amount of nuclear enlargement. So inflammation induced changes could include an enlargement of the size of the nuclei. There could be a very, very minimal hyperchromasia, but once the hyperchromasia is too much, then we are going into the realms of squamous intraepithelial lesions. So inflammation can do two things to the squamous cell, at least two things. One, it can lead to a pretty uh, appreciable amount of cytoplasmic faculation, but not to the extent of calling it a coelocyte. And two, it can lead to nuclear enlargement. Okay, sometimes you can find this change where the neutrophils are seen to be just uh, eating up the squamous cells. They're confined to the borders of the squamous cells. Here you have got vacuolations within a parabasal cell. And once again, you have got over here slightly smaller vacuoles, right? Some amount of nuclear debris. So these are some of the changes which can occur as a result of inflammation. However, just the presence of neutrophils does not make a smear as an inflammatory smear or to call it as changes associated with inflammation. No, you should see some of the other changes which I have just shown you. Sometimes you can find some nuclear changes, but I have, a, but I feel that most of the time, in my experience, I used to see a lot more of those nuclear changes like karyorexis, karyolysis, when I used to see conventional smears on the liquid based preparations. I am seeing uh, much, much less these, these, these changes in the nuclei. I don't see them as often, really. Right, so there are certain changes which can occur in endocervical cells. One such change is like a multi-nucleated uh, endocervical cell, okay, which, is, which can be present over here. Okay, well, one might argue, is, uh, is this a large, is a histocyte? I really don't know, but sometimes you can have multinucleated endocervical cells, sometimes you can have histiocytes. I'm not really very sure about this one. Some might argue that this is just a histiocyte, but more importantly, what you can see over here are reactive changes of endocervical cells. As you can see, there is some degree of overlap, okay, but there is the neutrophil coming in, degree of nuclear enlargement, opened up chromatin, not too much of hyperchromatia, prominent nucleoli. So these are inflammation related changes in the endocervical cells so called reactive changes in the endocervical cells so these are some of the other changes inflammation related endocervical cells some degree of overlap but enlargement of the nucleus it is very difficult to appreciate but you can see they're very sharp nuclear outlines you can see the prominence of nucleoli these are some of the reactive changes see once again here some reactive changes where the amount of muciness not too high very low amount, little amount, scanty mucin, uh, some amount of overlap. I know this is again a term which is, can be argued that whether you're going to call this as atypical uh, glandular cells because of the overlap, but you have to take into consideration a lot of features, but sometimes uh, reactive changes in endocervical cells can um, look like or go into, uh, can cover, cut a particular threshold so that you start thinking in terms of and uh, a of uh, atypical glandular cells, right? Now these are typical repair changes. We call typical repair, where you have these metaplastic cells. They are present in this form of aggregates. Okay, like a trabeculae, almost looks like a trabeculae of hepatocytes, if you could imagine. But then at one edge you have got uh, a columnar cell coming out over here. Uh, the cells show nuclear enlargement, okay, some of them so opened up chromatin, some amount of nucleolar prominence, 
So these are typical repair changes. Once again, changes of typical repair. Sometimes they're closely, um, there is a close admixture of, uh, um, of neutrophils. So these are changes associated with typical repair. Opened up chromatin, prominent nucleoli. This is a smaller group of cells. Okay, with opened up chromatin, prominent nucleoli. These are changes associated with uh, typical repair. The next group of lesions which you may come across not very often are changes associated with follicular cervicitis where in the cervix, in the wall of the cervix, you are as a histopathological counterpart, you are going to find uh, uh, lymphoid follicles. But when you take a cervical smear, these lymphoid cells can come out right on the smear various degrees of maturation associated with squamous cells. So this is a slide of follicular cervicitis. The next thing which can look really very nasty, and if you are unaware of the prior history, uh, it is very likely that you might make a mistake of even calling it a squamous cell cancer because the nuclear changes are really, really very sinister. As you can see, a very pleomorphic nucleus, bizarre looking nucleus. Uh, uh, the very uh, unusual shape with irregularly clumped chromatin and uh, irregular nuclear outlines and so is the cell over here. However, what we see and what is helpful apart from of course knowing the history, if you know the history that's great, but even if you don't know the history, there is something in the cell and that is although there is uh, a, a tremendous amount of pleomorphism in the nucleus, there is a increase in the size of the cells. Just see how humongous this cell is. So when there are changes in a cell, in the nucleus of the cell, but the cell size of the cell is also increased, there is a large increase in the cytoplasm, then you should start thinking that in terms of changes associated with radiation, you should uh, look into the clinical form if you haven't already done so, or call up the clinician and find out does this patient have any history of radiation? Because radiation can really lead to some absolutely horrendous looking squamous cells. Right. The next group of changes, once again, could be huge pitfalls, are changes related to the presence of intrauterine contraceptive devices. The important thing to remember is that these changes can persist for a significant amount of time, for months actually, even after the IUCD has been removed. So as you can see over here, there is a group of cells, these are actually endometrial cells, so the IUCD leads to the changes within the endometrial cells which are exfoliated like these ball-like clusters with nuclear enlargement, some opening up of chromatin, some prominence of nuclear life it is visible, so otherwise, if you are unaware of this fact that these are, uh, uh, this is from a patient with a history of IUCT, you might end up calling this as a glandular abnormality. You can see over here also, right? A cluster of cell, it's not a very good picture, but once again, nuclear enlargement, right? And it can show some amount of evacuations, right? And then this is another one. This is from the Bethesda Web Atlas. And here in this particular uh, cluster of cells, this is very interesting. You have these kind of, you have these vacuolated cells. The nuclei have got very sharp nuclear outlines uh, and prominent nucleoli, some degree of irregularity. And if you are unaware of the fact that this patient has had a history of intrauterine contraceptive device, then there is a very, very high chance that you can call it a glandular abnormality, even going on to call it possibly an endometrial carcinoma. So when the patient has an intrauterine contraceptive device, be very, very careful, right? And more interestingly, sometimes the endometrial cells can look like the single cells or just two cells with an extremely high nucleocytoplasmic ratio with some degree of irregularity of margins, very scanty degree of cytoplasm. And I am pretty certain that there is a very high chance that if you are unaware of this, these changes associated with IUCD, if you just show this cell, you might end up calling this as a high-grade cell, a high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. HCL cells can, choose, can look just like this. So one of the pitfalls of high-grade cell is the presence of cells associated with intrauterine contraceptive devices. This is another cell 
binucleated cell with a kind of a cell in cell appearance. All these are from patients from intrauterine contraceptive devices. And these are intrauterine contraceptive device induced changes. And uh, uh, again, these two pictures are from, uh, I've just picked up from the Bethesda Web Atlas. The previous ones are our cases. Right. Now, the last thing that we are going to deal with are the presence of glandular cells. So after hysterectomy, you do not expect to find glandular cells, but sometimes there can be an endocervical glandular metaplasia in the vaginal cuff. And these can come out when you are taking a vaginal sphere after hysterectomy. And they just look like normal endocervical glandular cells. So there is nothing to worry about that unless and until, of course, you find some glandular abnormalities in these cells. And in such circumstances, you are going to report them using the same criteria that you report other glandular abnormalities. So the important thing to remember at the end of this particular presentation is that there are many essential information on the clinical request form and which you should look for. And then there are certain changes which you see on the smear. You go back to the form and see if these things are present in the patient. You have to, to look for uh, the last menstrual period because the cervical smear patterns can change significantly. For example, the presence of endometrial cells are extremely high during the first few days after the last menstrual period. You should know the status we have already discussed related to pregnancy. You have seen the changes, something uh, like the area stellar reaction, presence of deciduous cells, cytotrophoblasts, associated with pregnancy, which can just push you towards a diagnosis of an int of, uh, of squamous as well as glandular intraepithelial lesion. Atrophic smears can just look absolutely ugly. Um, intake of hormonal preparation of the progesterone can also make the smears look like what you see in pregnancy. History of IUCD use, you have just seen. A history of local surgical procedures like conization or uh, uh, leap, these are the things which shortens the cervix and leads to the, increases the chances of uh, getting cells from the lower uterine segment. History of cancer related therapies. Okay, there have been some studies on the effect of uh, tamoxifen therapy in breast carcinoma and they've shown that there has been a significant increase in the so presence of uh, atypical squamous cells, right? So uh, these are some of the things which you should keep in mind. Thank you very much.